Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, welcome to the public meeting regarding rulemaking for IDAPA 1301-08-406, Rules Governing the Taking of Big Animals, Special Weapons, Season Muzzle Loader. I'm Amber Worthington, Deputy Director, and with me today I have... Brian Jack, Assistant Chief of Law Enforcement. Tricia Hebden, Assistant Chief of Wildlife. Toby Boudreau, Deer Elk Coordinator. Owen Maroney, Deputy Attorney General. Kathleen Trevor, Deputy Attorney General. Andre Lee, Public Information Specialist. And so for um, those of you on Zoom, we'll need you to provide your name and organization so we can get that recorded before we um, begin the meeting. I don't know a great organized way of doing that, but... Um, one by one, please. Um, okay, just a moment. Okay, looks like we are able to let you guys come off mute. I do see Chairman Mendive on, so if you'd like to start, Chairman Mendive. Thank you, Amber. Good to see everybody. Say, this is uh, Representative Ron Mendive. I chair Resources and Conservation, and uh, I'm here mostly representing myself, but I do have constituents that I've spoken uh, about with this, uh, this issue. So anyway, looking forward to the meeting. Thank you, Chairman. Next. How about Mr. Kurt Fuller? If you could unmute and uh, announce whether you are representing anyone else. No, I'm not representing anybody. I'm just a, an avid hunter, just wanting to know what the um, the results of this meeting will be. And then Bob Ferris. Not representing anybody, but a small group of four muzzleloader hunters. Hanging on the outcome. All right. Good morning, Clifton Nanny. Hi, I'm not representing anybody. Uh, this is actually my first muzzleloader hunt, so I'm just here to make sure I'm doing everything legally. Thank you, Clifton. All right. And then we have a Doug. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, my name is Doug Gochner. I'm just a hunter from Star. Hey, yeah, just an um, interested party, Idaho resident, wanting to see where this goes. Uh, okay, we have a Don Larson. Maybe. Okay, Mr. Larson, are you able to unmute? Like we might have lost you. Okay, uh, Bob. Sneed. Mr. Sneed, are you able to unmute? All right, we will come back around. How about Glenn Smith? I'm here in Lewiston, Idaho. Uh, good morning. Are you uh, representing any organization? No, I'm just a concerned sportsman. All right, good morning. Good morning. We have a Jeff Friendsdorf. Yeah, just another interested muzzle loader hunter. Not representing anyone. Okay, and we have a Steve. No last name? Just a muzzle loader hunter. Okay, uh, Steve, for the administrative record, we do need your last name, please. No. Neto, N A D E A U. All right, thank you. Uh, then we have Abby Delmas. This is Abby Delmas with Idaho Sportsman. 
right? And I did get your message, Mr. Sneed, that you are without microphone. Uh, Adam Canfield? Yeah, just a, just an <clears throat> Idaho hunter. Okay, we have a Monty. And if you do not have a microphone, if you could just send us a chat message just so we get your first and last name for our record. We have a Blair Pippo. Yes, it's Peepo. I'm just a uh, just a muzzleloader hunter. All right, thank you, Mr. Peepo. Bonnie O'Hara. Actually, it's Kevin O'Hara, and I am right. just looking to see what you're going to do with these changes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. O'Hara. Uh, Carla Hennifer. And realize we show up the screen name, so if some other member of your household is the routine Zoomer, that's that's what we get. So Yeah, so this is Carla, but my husband Robert is the one that's actually watching it. Okay, th thank you for uh, giving him the assist. Okay, we have a, a C hard. Okay, Chase. Yep, full name, Chase Craft, and I'm just representing myself. Okay, and then we also have a Chase Yearsley. Yeah, I'm not a resident, just a muzzleloader hunter as well. All right, and then we have uh, Chris Timerson. Good morning, Chris. Chris Timerson, Safari Club International. Uh, we also have a size need, if that is different than Bob's need. Hi, yeah, um, just a uh, just a hunter. All right, thank you, Dave Skinner. I'm just an fellow, interested hunter. I am a fellow muzzleloader hunter. Okay. Uh, Darren Bunger. All right, David Silcox. Again, if you don't have a mic, uh, just send us a chat and we will uh, get that information. All right, we have a DLBLY. We also have Earl Christensen. And then once you do talk, if you could put your microphone back on mute, please. All right, good morning. We have a Garrett Visser. Good morning, Garrett Visser, Idaho Wildlife Federation. We have a Glenn Smith. I've already responded. I'm a concerned sportsman from Lewiston. Thank you. Uh, we have a bunch of people coming in, so it's hard to keep track. Thank you for your patience. Jared Wilson. Jason Ellis. Jeff Friendsdorf. Okay, we already have him. Jeff Gilbert. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, concerned muzzleloader hunting. Hunter living up here in the Unit 1 Bonners Ferry. Joel Clark. Joel Sauter. Joel Sauter, just a concerned sportsman, muzzleloader hunter. All right. Joseph Bondenich, have you already? Uh, Mr. Bissell. We have Chris. Crawford. Yeah, resident Idaho muzzleloader hunter. All right, Kurt Fuller. Kyle Mackey. Uh, Kyle Mackey with the Idaho Wildlife Federation. Lars Johansson. Matthew McCauley. Yep, Matthew McCauley, Hunter. 
Mike Willis. Just a hunter from Hayden. We have Pamela with an iPad. Pamela Williams. I'm not affiliated with any organization. Regan Berkeley. Regan Berkeley, just interested on my own. Great. Uh, Ramon Royce. We yes, have, concern. Uh, 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 Ramon Royce, Lewiston, Idaho, resident hunter. Thank you. All right. We have uh, Commissioner Ron Davies. Would you like to introduce yourself? Just be aware that Commissioner Ron Davies of the same region is on the phone. Ron Merriman. Oh, concerned hunter. Ross Baker. Ross Baker, Hunter. Uh, Sarah Mar with, Mar with the department is on. Scott Carter. Steve Barton. Steve Wimbakey. It's Steve Perry. Just a concern, okay. Hunter. And uh, W. Berry. Bob Quarry. I think I can change my name. <laughs> All right. Is uh, there anyone else that I have not announced to announce yourself, please? Jared Blackham, just a concerned citizen. Right, Noel Clark. That, uh, thank you, Mr. Clark. Uh, if uh, anyone else can put their name in the chat just so we can record your presence for the administrative record. And with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Deputy Director uh, Amber Worthington. All right, thank you, Kathleen, and thank you everybody for joining today. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started since we have a limited amount of time. Um, be mindful that we are done at the one o'clock hour. It is a hard stop. We'll try to get everybody's comments in where possible and also observe that we did log a multitude of comments from the comment period. Um, so we're here today because the department received strong interest in addressing certain components of Chapter 406, Special Weapons Season for Muzzleloader. Most of the interest was centered on the projectile with concerns around the availability of supplies. In response, the Commission authorized the department to proceed with rulemaking. This is a long process that begins with Commission authorization, then permission from the Governor's Office to proceed into negotiated rulemaking. The department began negotiated rulemaking with the notice of intent to promulgate rules in the April 2023 Administrative Bulletin. The Department set a public meeting for April 19th, which was noticed on our IDFG rulemaking website as well as on townhallidaho.gov. Staff also reached out to muzzleloader groups to alert them of the public meeting and the open comment period. At the meeting, staff received no comments from any in attendance and only two emails regarding the rulemaking. In July, staff presented a proposed rule to the Commission, which was approved to move forward. The proposed rule was published in the Administrative Bulletin on October 4th and our IDFG rulemaking website October 5th. And in response to Commission direction, the Department also initiated additional public outreach, including two press releases. All activity notified the public. The comment period was open for proposed rule. Due to the outpouring of comments during the comment period, the Department elected to hold one additional meeting to hear from the public. Just a moment, sorry, folks. Um, sorry, hold one additional meeting to hear that from the public. That meeting is today and was noticed on IDFG's rulemaking website and townhallidaho.gov on October 23rd. Additional outreach included an email response to those who commented to alert them to this meeting. 
In total, that is three public meetings and two open comment periods. There will be one more attempt to comment at the Commission's November public meeting on November 15th. In all, the Department received 445 comments during the comment period. In reading the comments, staff recognized that there may be some confusion around which hunts this role change actually applies to. On the screen in front of you is a chart that shows the three different hunt types and what is allowable on those hunts. Muzzleloader can be used in any weapons hunt, the short range weapons only hunt, and the muzzleloader only hunt. Are you all able to see that chart on the screen? Okay. Mm -hmm. So as you can see the difference in the, the hunts that are allowed, uh, that muzzleloader are allowed in, the muzzleloader only is the only one that is as restrictive as you see it on the screen, which is the rule that we are um, looking at today. The other two hunts are any weapon hunt and the short range, range weapons only hunt, which muzzle louder is also allowed in. The big difference, um, the only difference in all three of them is the caliber. So the caliber is the only thing that is restrictive in any of those hunts. Otherwise, it's muzzle loader only that has the, the largest number of restrictions. So as you can see, the short range weapons hunt is pretty much anything that you would do in any of the any weapons hunts. Um, so just so everybody understands, we're talking muzzleloader only special weapons season hunt. Um, let's see where we're at next. So and that that applies to these hunts. Um, so you've got the general hunt, any weapon, short range, and muzzleloader only. So as you can see, the muzzleloader only hunts are um, very limited in number. And this is more specific tally. This is about 100 hunts. Toby, is that correct? It's 88 hunts. 88 hunts. Between muzzleloader and um, short range weapons. So we have 63 different muzzleloader hunts in <laughs> Idaho with elk, deer, white tailed deer, and pronghorn. So we just wanted to make sure we, we frame that picture for everybody because we did have so many different diverse comments, some that were not relevant to what we're specifically talking about, but we definitely wanted you to understand we acknowledge those comments and wanted to make sure it's clear in everybody's mind what we're actually speaking to. Um, so moving along, and just so you can see also, this is in the actual rules right now. This is current rules, so this is the muzzleloader chapter. Special weapon season, this is the one we're reviewing. This is specific to short range weapons. So the only thing there is the 45 cal and um, caliber restrictions that are listed, or 45 cal and 50, depending on the species that are being hunted. And then in any weapons general, again, it's that caliber that I was speaking about earlier. So that's the common theme throughout all three um, rule sections, but otherwise we are speaking specifically to uh, muzzleloader hunts only. So as noted, the department received 445 comments in the comment period. Of those 445 comments, 289 were, support in, were in support of the rule change, which is 65% in favor. We received comments like, I believe a better bullet would lead to better blood trails and recovery of animals. We can still leave it primitive, but give us better tips for the hunter and the animal's sake. Another is, with open sights, loose powder, and open ignitions, this is still a primitive hunt, regardless of how modern, violent, or accurate a bullet is. Another is, without the option to use a scope, improved ammunition seems to only reduce the number of lost animals. Another would be, I like the primitive rifle part, but I think a projectile rule change is warranted and due. Um, finally, let's see, 139 we received comments um, opposed the rule, 31% of the folks um, with comments like, by keeping it primitive, it allows for expanded hunting opportunities. If you change it, you may well turn it into a rifle hunting. And then another is, it is in the best interest of the sport to keep the regulations of muzzleloader season as traditional as possible. Finally, 17 comments, or 4%, didn't specifically support or oppose but we received comments like this. Model, modern muzzleloaders are blurring the lines of distinction between themselves and modern rifles. A modern muzzleloader and sabot bullet combination can be accurate to ranges extending to and beyond 200 yards. 
I think that defeats the intent of a specific muzzle loader season. The voices calling for allowance of eased restrictions do not understand that increased efficacy of this weapon could lead to decreased hunting opportunity in the future. Um, of those comments, we also found that 10.7% included a mention of 209 primers and that 9.4% wanted SABIT. So this is the general scope of what we've received in comments. And with that, um, unless anybody has anything else to share, um, we'll open the floor. So please be respectful of each other and each other's time as we move through this next hour. Um, we are open to hearing comments. Can anyone oh, comment? Yes. Uh, yes, Chairman, anybody can. Um, okay. And we would ask that people use the hand raise so we can be respectful of people. <laughs> um, believe it or not, I'm not sure how to do that, but when, if I, if you have an opening for me, I'd love to testify. You have the floor, sir. Thank you. Um, Amber, do I refer to you as Madam Chairman or Deputy Director? Or? Deputy Director, please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Deputy Director, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, and as I said before, I'm state representative and I chair resources and conservation, and I represent Legislative District 3 in the new districting. And I am strongly in favor of allowing Sabbaths, uh, and I did submit written testimony, so I appreciate your looking at that and, and categorizing that. Um, as a, a longtime muzzleloader hunter, I've experienced hang fire, I've experienced misfire um, <clears throat> with trying to shoot at elk. So I understand that it's still a primitive weapon, no matter how you look at it, as long as you keep the, the open primer and, and uh, open sights, it's definitely primitive. Um, I. Uh, I think that they do, Sabbaths do allow for uh, better recovery of the game, which was, which I, was in my written comments. I would like to say, though, that today um, in modern rifles, you, you can go off the shelf and buy a rifle that you can group at 800 yards. Uh, the game has changed mm -hmm. dramatically over the years, and uh, a muzzleloader we're restricting, but also uh, archery has improved a lot over the years. I think the biggest problem up here in the north is the wolf, uh, the wolves of restricted hunting. I've I've been doing this for a lot of years, and and the biggest problem is wolves. And I, I really think that uh, hunting has changed forever, and you guys are going to have to regulate the seasons proportionate to how many uh, wolves there are. And uh, maybe maybe we could give the muzzleloader guys a break. I would just simply like to say that uh, I I am strongly in favor of sabots. The terminal performance is far superior to anything that I'd uh, ever experienced previously, and. Uh, I think uh, um, that even the pelletized powder is not necessarily a, a, a deal breaker. I, it makes for a faster uh, reload. Um, as you know, muzzleloader is one of the slowest. Uh, even an arrow, you can knock another arrow rather quickly. Um, muzzleloader takes a second or two to, to reload if you have to have a follow-up shot. So all things considered, I, I was highly disappointed when that rule was changed years ago. I appreciated their reasoning um, because they wanted to try to extend hunting opportunities for muzzleloader folks. But the reality is, I think just a lot of game is shot, but not harvested. And so I would really appreciate the rule change. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, so it looks like we don't have the hand raised capability. So turn the video on. Um, if you could turn the video on and we'll make that the cue for us to know that you'd like to speak. So, Doug, I see your video on. Would you like to start? You're on, you're on mute. Please unmute. And now our hand raises are working, but we'll let Doug go first. Okay. Under the reactions um, uh, tab at the bottom, you can raise your hand, just FYI. Thank you. We're seeing it now. So, Doug, go ahead. It was you, and now I don't see you any longer. Um, so, Yes. I have. I bought one of the early inline muzzleloaders and spent a lot of time at the range. With round balls, I could not hit the target. 100 yards because the twist was too fast in my rifle. Uh, 
I did shoot uh, the elongated lead bullets, a variety of them. I could hit the target, but my group was about the size of a basketball. Uh, I took it hunting that first fall and wounded an elk, uh, three out of five shots, and uh, finally was able to salvage her, and I feel good about that. But then I found this publication that the Fish and Game put out about ballistics, and uh, I hope you all can see it. The Idaho Fish and Game put this out about ballistics, and clearly the Sabbat is the best, with a handgun bullet, is the best round to use, especially in rifles like mine that have a fast twist. I hunted it that way for a few years, but then all of a sudden you outlawed Sabbats, and I put my gun away, and I have been uh, using my regular rifle since then. Uh, I'm disappointed. Um, it seems like if I have the responsibility to stalk an animal, get close enough to shoot, I want to hit that animal hard and kill it. And I have no confidence in those elongated bullets and certainly without round, ball, round balls with my particular rifle, they go everywhere. Uh, so I really, uh, I really wish you'd reconsider the issue in Sabbaths. I strongly support that. I can hit a pretty good group a hundred yards uh, with my rifle. Thank you. Okay, Ramon Royce. Yes, Dep thank you, Deputy Director and Fishing Game Representatives. I just wanted to uh, second on what Ron discussed, except for hit on the fact of the opportunity for us hunters and sportsmen to shoot a sabotaged bullet due to lead. We're pretty well versed and aware of just the consequences of consuming lead, touching lead and then going into our game meet where I have a family of uh, four children and we consume mostly elk and deer that I harvest with a muzzleloader. And I would like to have the opportunity to either, either use all copper bullets or, or a, a jacketed copper lead bullet. And that's something that I think that's uh, pertinent to this discussion. And uh, along with just superior terminal performance, performance, less wounded animals. And so I think that is a, it's a critical, critical aspect and why in, in, in waterfowl too, I think it's, it correlates with uh, going to exclusive steel shot or non-toxic shot. And so it only makes sense if we're consuming and I'm feeding my children an animal that I harvested with a muzzleloader to have the option of shooting a jacketed lead or a uh, a lead free projectile. Thank you. Thank you. And next I have Jared. Uh, yes, I just wanted a point of clarification, uh, Deputy Director. My understanding is current regulations require the bullets to be within one tenth of the bore size. Are we? considering the use of sabots to allow a smaller diameter bullet to fall outside of those current regulations? Or are we only discussing the impact of allowing a full bore sized copper jacketed or full copper projectile? <clears throat> the way the proposed rule was written, it would be for bore riding jacketed bullets would be allowed. So it would not allow a sabot then under the current proposal. It would only be a full bore conical. Is that correct? That is correct, Jared. Okay. So I, I have had good luck with both um, full lead and full sized conicals shoot excellent out of most of my traditional and my inlines, as long as the appropriate twist and time is taken to, you know, get a very accurate load. Um, I find that the low velocity lead bullets don't expand and d disintegrate like the high velocity rifle rounds that spread lead throughout the body. Um, I, I do agree there is some lead risk 
But if we talk about expanding the opportunity to get bullets that are more available, the the options of full bore copper jacketed conicals are limited and expensive. And I feel like allowing those does move us away from the, you know, the traditional quote unquote muzzle loading style. Um, I personally am in, in favor of maintaining the regulations the way they currently are and enjoying the sport for what it is. Um, I think those that find some issues with accuracy and a lack of available um, available ammunition or available conicals, there are more available now than there ever has been. In my opinion, there's, there's a lot available online, some very good high quality conicals and some very good high quality guns that I think no matter what type of rifle you use, whether it's a high powered rifle or a muzzle loader, the time behind the gun is really where the uh, efficient kill and efficacy of the shot is earned. And if, you know, if there's a, a, an accuracy issue in concern with your gun, then, you know, I think that's on the hunter to try and find what available options are out there and try to improve that accuracy within the the confines of the regulations. Um, so I'm, I'm in favor of just maintaining the, the traditional, the traditional muzzle loader seasons as they are. I would maybe in the future consider some full copper as opportunities, but I think the velocities that are allowed right now wouldn't allow those bullets to open efficiently and provide the effective kills that, you know, real black powder and some of these lower velocity powders that we're currently using would, I don't think they would provide the expected outcome of a, of a full copper bullet just because they require some higher velocities. But that's my own two cents. And I, I appreciate the regulations as they are. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Jared. It looks like next we've got Don Larson. Yeah, I'm in my car. Let me pull over. Let me pull over just a minute. Yep, no problem. Say, Please do. Longtime muzzleloader hunter, frustrated with the new regulations. I have killed three elk that had power belt bullets uh, in them from a previous hunt. One was from obviously a year earlier where the bullet was totally encased. Um, another one. The uh, hind quarters is where it hit. It was so infected that I had to throw the uh, hind quarter away. And then another was a fresh wound from uh, uh, another hunter that same year. Um, with the previous regulations where sabos and uh, modern uh, handgun bullets are allowed, um, I have never had to take more than one shot to down an animal. And it's sort of frustrating to try to explain to my uh, son-in-law who just started hunting um, the ethical dilemma that you have of using the current regulations and having a good chance of wounding an animal and not recovering it uh, versus what I think we should be doing and that's killing an animal humanely quickly um, it's just tough to explain to my son-in-law, a new hunter, and my grandkids. So I am definitely in favor of the uh, Sabo being allowed with um, with modern handgun bullets or full copper bullets. That's my two cents. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, next, I have Steve. <laughs> Yeah, hi. Um, I was curious, Toby, if um, you had any information or any data studies done on um, what the wounding loss is for muzzle loaders, and if there's any difference between the different uh, projectile metal alloys, because uh, I think wounding loss is a concern for most of us muzzle loaders. Um, and an, an improvement in that would be uh, probably critical in the decisions here as well. So I, I'd be curious to know what you know. Steve, I don't believe there is any uh, peer-reviewed literature on the 
wounding loss and the differences in wounding loss between different sorts of muzzleloader bullets. But you know, we do know that from lots of ballistics research that you know bullets that carry more energy to the target, whatever that range may be, are more lethal. And that's about all. Um, but as far as wounding loss studies, I don't know of any that have been done. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Steve. I have Matthew McCauley next. Yeah, I'll keep mine uh, brief. Um, one of the reasons I got into muzzleloader hunting is I like the traditional aspect of muzzleloading, just being a kind of a gun enthusiast. And uh, I'm just in favor of keeping the rules as they currently are. I think they're some of the better rules in the West as far as keeping the uh, weapon more traditional. And in the proposed uh, rulemaking, it said that the uh, rule was being proposed um, because of a lack of av availability of projectiles. And I just haven't found that to be much of an, an issue. Um, so yeah, just in favor of keeping them as is. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Next I have Ross Baker. Yeah, um, thanks for uh, holding this comment section. Um, you know, I think I think it's our obligation as hunters to uh, ensure that um, we have the opportunity to make uh, the cleanest and ethical kill possible uh, when we decide to pull that trigger. Um, that range that we pull the trigger is different for everybody. Um, you know, I got into to to muzzle into muzzleloader hunting for um you know the the close range opportunity and the fair chase uh that comes with a muzzle loader um and i think with the, the the current regulations you still encourage that get close fair chase opportunity however um allowing a bullet that will kill an animal as quickly as possible and and um and be more lethal um is a it's a no brainer regulation to me and that i i believe it should be allowed um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to comment. Okay. Thank you, Ross. Next I have Dave Kangas. Thank you. I'm a hunter representing myself in Boise and I support the regulations as they are. I appreciate the primitive arms aspect of this. For those that want to shoot sabos and all, you know, 209 ignition, all of that to increase their velocities, they have seasons for that. So I think we should be working to just keep these as primitive arms. Um, I have had no problems finding an accurate lead bullet um, from Great Plains, Toplin Center, no excuse. There's a great variety. I haven't tried power belts, but if there's a problem with power belts, we as hunters shouldn't be using them. Um, and I've got open range, ac you know, open sight accuracy down to three inches at 100 to 125 yards. So I see no accuracy problems with them. I appreciate the uh, full lead bullet for the weight that it carries down range versus a light bullet. So I support leaving the regulations the way they are. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, Darvid, Darren Bunger. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, great. Well, I've only been hunting muzzleloader for four years got three shots at animals, harvested two. The two animals were at, one was at 60 yards, one was at 40 yards. Uh, neither of them acted hit. Um, they're both hit double long, and there was little to no blood. One of them had no blood trail. The projectile just opened up, uh, plugged the entry hole, no exit wound. Um, really hard to recover the animal. I thought I missed, and I've heard of other hunters talking about this. So I just believe in maybe a sabot with better penetration 
um, maybe an exit wound. Um, again, I'm new to this, but I thought, you know, a 50 caliber round at 50 yards would, would leave an impact and down an animal and, and let it act hit. But that wasn't the case. So I was kind of disappointed and would like to see that rule change to a more penetrating bullet. That's it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, David, we'll be right back, okay? We'll be right back. You eat your bone. <laughs> okay, we got uh, someone talking to their dog. If you could put uh, your phone on mute, please. Yeah, are you able to hear me? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I appreciate you guys for, uh, reaching out and doing all the public outreach that you did. Um, it's considerably better than it originally started. Um, I am a muzzleloader hunter and I am associated with uh, several people who are muzzleloader hunters. Um, we've harvested a lot of animals with lead bullets and we have never had a problem uh, with the recovery or anything. And we've done it with multiple different very varying yardages. Uh, and they have been extremely accurate. Um, I support leaving the regulation as is. Um, I'm not sure what our reasoning was years ago when we went away from sabots and pistol bullets, but I'm guessing it's, uh, well, I don't know. It would be interesting to know why that rule was changed. But I support keeping the regulations as they are. If you wanna hunt with a sabot, or a copper bullet or anything else for that matter, those uh, seasons are out there for you. They're called short range seasons. My biggest fear in allowing this, expanding yardage and those types of things is that I'm afraid we're gonna see a, a increased reduction in what little muzzleloader opportunity we have now. I realize there's, I think Toby said 60 plus hunts around the state, um, but they have been decreased over time and uh, I have to share my muzzleloader hunting opportunity now with rifle hunters, um, with general ATAG hunters. If I choose to make a muzzleloader only elk hunt, for example, my hunt for the year, I have to share that with a whole bunch of other people out there and I just see things deteriorating even farther. Therefore, I don't support this change. Um, I would like to see it stay as is. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to comment. Thank you, David. Um, Syce Sneed? Uh, yeah, hey, um, I just wanna say that first and foremost, I appreciate you guys doing this and uh, for everybody on the call, uh, whether you're for or against, uh, you know, it's great to have everybody on uh, voicing their opinion. Um, I support not uh, changing the rules. I think that um, the lead bullets are, um, plentiful. Uh, there's several manufacturers um, that I've tried for, for my muzzleloader. Um, and, you know, I've got some targets here that I could show of this is a four shot group at a muzzleloader certification class with a lead bullet offhand 50 yards. Um, I shot a group last week inside of an inch with my muzzleloader, uh, my hunting load at a hundred yards. Um, so I think that the, uh, accuracy uh side of things is is not necessarily valid um like i said there's several manufacturers several bullets um and trying one that uh, will work i know guys you know really complain about the power belts if that's the if that's the case i've not tried those um you know maybe they they should be um, addressed uh, differently than than the other lead bullets um i do think that the full uh copper or bore rider bullets are actually harder to find than the, uh, you know, full lead uh, 50 caliber bullets anyway. So uh, anyway, thanks again. Um, I, uh, I think we should keep things the way they are and uh, I really appreciate you guys doing this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Cy. Um, next we have Kurt Fuller. You there, Kurt? Yeah, he's there, but not off mute. Okay, unmute, unmute yourself there, Kurt, please. 
Um, I didn't raise yeah. my hand. I'm just uh, um, enjoying listening to the uh, comments for right now. Okay, thank you. Then we have Joseph von Benedict. Yeah, thanks for uh, hosting this. Just have a, a few comments. I've, I actually make a living uh, writing and podcasting about uh, hunting, shooting, competing, so forth. Uh, Toby knows me, old friends, but uh, just some observations. Uh, I think a lot of the issue with uh, wounding that we see today is due to uh, bullets being made for white-tailed deer something like 80 plus percent of the game shot with muzzle loaders these days is white tailed deer. And so most of the manufacturers engineer their bullets for that. If you're getting poor penetration, it's probably because you're getting over on impact and that results in uh, unfortunate losses because of lot, you know, lack of blood trails, lack of adequate penetration. One thing I'm worried about is if you open uh, the the regulations to allow all modern Sabo bullets, you're going to see hunters using a lot more whitetail bullets and capable of making hits at 200 and 250 yards and so forth. Uh, so now you're going to have deer, sorry, elk, which seem to be the primary species on, you know, on the subject here, being shot at 200 and 250 yards with inadequate bullets instead of even, you know, just the traditional ranges we deal with now. I do think if you're just looking for increased killing ability, that an all uh, copper or a mono metal type bullet will give much better performance on elk. You should get pass throughs from most shot angles and uh, very good expansion. They're a terrific bullet for killing elk. But all that said, you know, I've, I've lived in several states with very liberal muzzleloader regulations and the, the capability of these modern muzzleloaders is impressive. And that's both good and bad that, you know, you're, you're gaining accuracy now that would have impressed rifle hunters 30 years ago with muzzleloaders. And that does kind of, yeah, they're still slow to load, but a pretty well kind of, uh, you know, is against the original reason for having a muzzleloader season. So I also grew up hunting with a flintlock. And <laughs> given my druthers, I'd say keep the season as primitive as possible. 1840s and previous era, you know, type equipment and loads that make me just as happy as a clam. Just because I enjoy that traditional primitive season type of hunting. And I've seen round balls kill big bull elk very cleanly ethically inside of 100 yards you just have to know your limitations and you have to pair your bullet with an appropriate shooting tool just like you wouldn't stick a wood arrow into a compound bow you shouldn't be loading lead round balls into a modern inline muzzleloader so just my two cents you know if you're if you're going to open this to increased uh performance bullets make sure that copper bullets have an emphasis in there power belt bullets are one of the you know, the primary examples of a white tail bullet. That's why they tend to have such a rep bad reputation on elk. So an all model metal bullet will, will actually accomplish this ethical increased lethality on elk. If you're going to move that route, I think that's something worth promoting. On the other hand, for those of us that would like to see the primitive seasons remain, you know, just encourage folks to use a traditional tool to shoot a traditional projectile. Uh, that's it. Just want to thank you all as well for your hard work and diligent efforts in researching and opening this up to the public. All right. Thank you, Joseph. Appreciate that. Can you do the chat comments? Okay. We're going to go through the chat comments. And, and just uh, for the record purposes, we'll go through who has uh, submitted comments in the chat. Uh, Bruce Winder in favor of the rule change. Monty in favor of the change. Uh, Mr. Royce, we also have your uh, chat comment that you're strongly in favor of the projectile change. Uh, Mr. Berry, in favor of the change that's in the rule proposed. Mr. Merriman is, in, is not in favor of the change uh, or in favor of no change to the rule. Mr. Fuller is in favor of no change to the rule. Mr. Sneed is in favor of no change to the rule. 
Dave Skinner in favor of no change to the rule. Uh, Mr. Johansson, I think this is a great idea. The new bullets and materials are a great compromise versus Sabbath. Mr. Ellis is against any changes. Joel Fodder, I'm in favor of the change, would like any meat to be free from lead contamination, and Mr. Sodder indicating lead is not safe for human consumption at any level. Mr. Clark joined late, uh, and he asked if 209 primers have been discussed. Um, for that question, 209 primers are not part of the staff proposed changes that were approved by the commission. And there was a review uh, of the distinction where 209 primers uh, would be not allowed in muzzle loader only hunts, but they are allowed in any uh, weapon or short range only hunt. And then uh, Mr. Johansson also has most of the rifles in current production are designed for Sabbath. So we can see the preference of Sabbath, as stated earlier, the allowance of belted alloy bullets is a good step forward. Bob Corey in favor of change. Uh, Joel Sauter uh, made additional comment that lead risk in a muzzle loader is about the same as a rifle shooting a 465 grain lead projectile and muzzle loader with 90% weight retention means 46 grams is lost into the meat. On a modern rifle with 180 gram bullets and 75% retention, the loss of lead is about the same. And uh, we have recorded that Mr. Tish has entered the, or did attend the meeting. Bob Ferris recorded as against change. Mr. Bissell in favor of the proposed rule change. Uh, a phone, Samsung is against the change. Not the phone, but the user of the phone. Uh, Don Charbonneau is in favor of the change. Mike Willis in favor of the change. Trevor Clark in favor of the change. Uh, Chase Crop against change. Jeff Gilbert in favor of the rule change. Uh, Bob Ferris with additional comment against change. I think most in favor of the change are thinking Sabbath, which is not in the proposed rule. Brad Johnson, clarification question. Am I correct? The proposed change would only allow jacketed lead conical or mono metal conical, uh, and a question of Sabbath would still be unlawful under the proposed rule. Yes, to clarify, Sabbath is, under the current proposed rule, Sabbath would still be uh, unlawful to use in a muzzle loader only season but you can use them in short range weapons and any weapon hunts currently. Then we have Mike in favor of change. Uh, Steve Barton, open sights limiting factor for long distance accuracy, not the bullet, copper bullets give a pass through and exist exit wounds produce the best blood trail. I'm for the change for copper bullet, but no scopes and no 209 primer. Earl Christensen in favor of change. Uh, Steve asked, would there be any change in season structure with change in projectile? Um, to answer that question, that is done in a completely different public process that is not connected directly to this rulemaking. Doug, uh, support the change, but also re ask to reconsider Sabbath, please review the publication that uh, he held up during the meeting, Muzzleloader Performance and Limitations from 1991 by Idaho Fish and Game. Glenn Smith opposed to change, Brad Johnson in favor of proposed change, and would also support uh, allowing non-magnifying scopes. And we have two other hand raises now. Okay, so back to verbal comment. It looks like we've got Glenn Smith waiting. Yes, I'm here. I was just wanting to put my name in on those who are uh, opposed to the changes. And that was my whole my whole spiel. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith. And then Bob Ferris. I want to thank you for your time and allowing us to participate in this uh, meeting. I am not in favor 
of a change. I have hunted muzzleloader in a rifle season and still choose to hunt with an all lead projectile and consider it practice for my muzzleloader hunts. I think the way that it's set up with loose grain powder and lead bullets that are fit, slip fit to our barrel can give incredible accuracy uh, beyond a hundred yards even. Uh, last year, I hunted 23 days of a 30-day elk hunt, and I was not able to shoot one time as I waited for an ethical shot. In that same time period, I could have shot at over 400 elk in the range of a 7-millimeter Remington Magnum. I believe that muzzleloader should stay the way that it is and be... Um, as traditional as we can keep it at this point in time. And I thank you for allowing my input. Thank you, Mr. Ferris. We have one additional comment in the chat from David Silcock. All my animals harvested with all lead bullets have passed through or caused considerable damage and recovery was not a problem. Okay, looks like we've got Dave Skinner. Yes, uh, I did vote on the chat, but I wanted to just make a statement. So thank you again for this opportunity today. And as a longtime traditional muzzleloader hunter, um, I wanted to say that in regards to availability being the reason for this bullet change proposal, I do not support the rule change. I think researching and contacting vendors and suppliers for improved availability would be the solution for the stated problem. Uh, hunter due diligence in adjusting their rifle, bullet weight, and powder quantity uh, will improve their accuracy in grouping uh, for this traditional muzzleloader range. I fully support keeping our traditional muzzleloader as is. Thank you, Mr. Skinner. And is there anybody else on the call that would like to comment that hasn't had a chance to yet? Anybody else that would like to have a further comment that already commented previously? Amber? Jason, I see your... Yes. Um, yeah, that's Representative Mendive again, if I'm, it's okay. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, I can shoot a round ball accurately with my traditional 50 caliber at 100 yards all day long, but I do not believe that would be ethical to shoot an elk. I've shot an elk with that one time. I did not recover that animal. Luckily, someone else did, but it's just, uh, it's a, it is a matter of terminal performance. I think uh, the Sabbath change is a necessary tool. Anyone that wants untraditional still can, and it, it's not, we're not forcing people to use this Sabbath. I think it's the most effective tool I've seen in over 40 years of muzzleloader hunting, and I, I would really like to see the rule change. So thank you very much for your time, and um, see you soon. All right. Thank you, sir. Okay, Jason? Ellis? Jason just dropped off. <laughs> Sarah, I see your hand up. Hi, uh, I just wanted, because there was a little bit of extra time to uh, ask a question from an email that I received, and maybe we can get a public response to that. It's from Brett Remblensky, and he asked, uh, for further clarification, I see information regarding the muzzleloader only season will be removed from section one. How will this impact the use of muzzleloaders during short range weapon seasons? Um, I'm so, Sarah, could you repeat what provision the question I think, is about? So, I think they're looking at this section one right here in the in the Word document that you have displayed, and they're just wondering if that's somehow changing other seasons versus mother, muzzle loader seasons. Uh, so the rule is for 
special weapons, muzzle loader only seasons. It, it, that's what the big type next to the O1 uh, indicates, and the, these provisions would not affect the ability to use a muzzle loader hunt, uh, in a short range or general hunt. Those were as described at the beginning of the meeting with far fewer restrictions. So, and to further clarify, I think, Sarah, the question probably was around season setting because we did a red line there in that area. It was just basically duplicative. Okay. So it's still done in the same manner. It will still be held in the same way. So season setting will still be done in a public format. Um, so that has not changed. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see Mr. Ellis, so Mr. Silcock. Thank you for letting me comment again. Um, I understand and appreciate the representative's issue with round balls. However, you're going to make the stretch from a round ball straight to a copper bullet or a sabotage bullet without attempting any further satisfaction with a conical bullet. I think what I've heard many times and in all the discussions and the chats that I've been involved with, those people that had a problem with power belt bullets, mainly because it's a whitetail bullet, well, the answer is don't shoot power belts at elk. And if you have a long gun muzzle loader that you've shot round balls in, well, if that didn't work for you, don't shoot round balls. Go to a conical and try that. I've never had a problem killing anything with a conical bullet out of my muzzleloader. Uh, we've harvested elk at 150 yards with a conical and had full body penetration. Entry into a front shoulder, exit near a rear quarter. Um, there's plenty of other projectiles out there to try. Uh, many people have stated adjusting your powder, your loads, it's, it's time at the range. And I think with a little time and energy, um, for me, that's what's enjoyable, is going out there and working on my loads to get the accuracy that I need. And with a 454 grain conical bullet, um, I have almost 100% retention on those lead bullets. We lose very little lead. Um, my son harvested a nice bull last year, went through two shoulders and a spine, and still had 98% retention on the bullet, and that was an all-lead bullet. I just, I'm afraid we're going down a slope that we're not gonna be able to get back from. Some of the states around us that's gone through some of these changes and made them liberalized, now they're looking at backtracking and getting more restrictive again. And um, that's why I don't support the change. So that's my final comment, appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Okay. And we do have uh, just a few comments in the additional comments in the chat. Uh, and again, we have 10 minutes until the end of the meeting, just to make sure we keep on time. Mr. Sneed has asked, uh, didn't think Sabbaths were even being considered. Similarly, Steve asked, does this rule have anything to do with Sabbaths? And Mr. Ellis did make a comment of, if there is a shortage of lead projectiles, may I suggest pouring your own bullets? I've been making my own since I was eight years old. Dave Skinner, this is not a rule change based upon anything other than availability. Availability does not seem to be the common discussion here to traditional muzzle loaders as is. Okay, and so to answer the question about our Sabbaths being considered, it is not in the staff proposal, however, um, changing the prohibition of Sabbaths is within the scope of this rulemaking. And we have Mr. Brad Johnson is up. Okay, and looks like we've got Mr. Johnson. Yeah, thanks for um, taking our calls and you partially just answered one of my questions. But as I understand the proposed rule change here, currently round ball and conicals are legal. This would only allow 
jacketed conicals or mono medical mono metal conicals, but would not add sabots, does not change 209 primers. So effectively the change as stated in this document we're looking at would not increase the range of muzzle loaders, would not change the manner in which you hunt with muzzle loaders, and would not outlaw current bullets that people are enjoying. So to me it is uh, I'm in support of the change. I don't see that the department needs to be in the business of uh, telling people which bullets they should choose. The primary elements of what the department uh, has controlled here is the range of the weapon by controlling the velocity. And I don't see the velocity and, and, and uh, scopes. I don't see any thing here in this change that alters the range or velocity. So I would say it's a no-brainer. Let people choose the bullets they want. If you like what you're using, continue using it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And it looks like we have Rep Mendive up again. <laughs> Thank you, Amber. Uh, and just a quick comment. Um, it was kind of implied that I hadn't done my homework. And I started with a 50 caliber round ball, you know, traditional. I got all the way up to 58 caliber maxi ball with 535 grains with 120 to 130 grains of loose powder. I've been there and done that. I've harvested a lot of elk over the years. And I have, there's nothing that will compare to the terminal efficiency of a Sabbat. And so, I, but I have done my homework. I've been doing this for over 40 years, so... Anyway, I've been successful. I enjoy the muzzleloader hunt. That's all I do now. So anyway, thanks again. Thank you, sir. And then uh, two additional comments on chat, which is Monty Tish, better for all not to put more lead in the environment. And Travis Lively, I agree with Brad Johnson. We are getting close to our hard stop. Is there any last minute comments? Okay, thank you all for joining. Oh, I see a real quick hand there. Um, who have we got, Glenn Smith? I just wanted to thank you for given us all this opportunity to have our voices heard. Thanks again. Thank you for that comment. Appreciate it. All right. I think that, that that's good. If everybody's good, uh, thank you so much for joining today. I think it's been a very productive um, session, so I really appreciate all the comments. Um, and then uh, just as a reminder, we will put this in front of the commission. Um, during their November commission meeting, there will be one last time to have this in front of them for public comment at that point in time during their business or their uh, their public hearing or public meeting. Sorry. Um, so until then, uh, best wishes to y'all. Thank you.